Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar, one of the webinars in our Early Childhood series. We hope that you've had the opportunity to join us in the past for some of the other webinars that we presented in this series. If you haven't been able to join us, if you weren't able to join us, you can view the recordings of those webinars. They are available on our website, pearsonclinical.com slash childhood. Today we're going to be focusing on learner outcomes and assessment, and we want to give some thought to the wealth of assessment data that you have available in your early childhood programs. As a teacher, if you're a teacher, we know that you collect data on an ongoing basis as you're monitoring children's progress. You want to be able to provide immediate feedback to children about the work that they're doing in relation to your expectations. Probably want to be able to provide feedback to families. Um, also, at different times during the year, teachers as well as administrators collect data to identify children's progress toward specified benchmarks. So I want us to think about the assessment data that are available in our early childhood programs and how we can use those data to make sense of the progress or the accomplishments of the students um, with whom we interact on a daily basis. Now, we sent out the handout, the slides I'm showing you here today, we sent out the handout early this morning, so if you did not receive that handout, if you would just note that in the chat box and we'll be sure to get that over to you. But in terms of the objectives for the next hour, I want to talk about how assessment data and how the data that are available can help us to adjust our teaching strategies when we think about an individual child or maybe a group of children. What do the data tell us about the child's progress toward specific um, goals, and what do we need to do maybe at times to adapt or modify our teaching strategies to ensure that all children are mastering the, the grade level objectives. We also want to think about how the assessment data might help us to identify strengths in our curricula and our instruction, as well as gaps in curricula and instruction, and how the data might help us to monitor progress, whether you're thinking about progress at the state level, at the district level, at the level of the school. So to get us started thinking about the assessment data, I want us to think about two um, broad concepts. I want us to think about assessment, and I want us to think about learner outcomes. So when you think about assessment, Assessment as we know, and we've talked about this during some of the other webinars that we presented in the Early Childhood series, assessment is an integral part of instruction as we know. Assessment data will provide us with information about how well um, children are pr progressing toward state standards. So when you think about the learner outcomes, think about the state standards that pretty much define for us what our expectations are with respect to children. Standards help us to define or define for us what we expect students to know and what we expect them to be able to do. So when you think about state standards, state standards often help us as we are specifying objectives, as we are specifying learner outcomes. But when you think about the learner outcomes, when you're thinking about how we would know if children are in fact able to do what, we're, what we expect them to be able to do or what is defined according to the state standards, how do we make sure that 
all children are meeting those standards. Well, really what we do when we're working with children is we tend to develop um, learning experiences, right? We tend to develop a body of learning experiences, which we refer to as the curriculum, and we tend to provide specific learning experiences in a specific scope and sequence that will allow children to learn the content on which we're focused in the state standards. So you're thinking about how we ensure that children meet the state standards. It's by establishing uh, our curricula and by specifying um, learning experiences um, that we then would focus on during instruction. So when you think about assessment, you certainly want to think about assessment in the context of both curriculum and instruction as well as the state standards. And the assessment is really the component that will help us to determine whether children are learning the content that we're teaching. Now, when you think about assessment, curriculum, and instruction, we recognize the interrelated nature of those components. Certainly the assessment data might lead to adaptations or modifications in terms of the body of learning experiences, the curriculum, and might also lead to adaptations or modifications in terms of the instruction. So instruction um, leads to assessment, assessment informs instruction, so think about how these pieces are interrelated. When we think about the state standards or the learner outcomes, they certainly apply to the individual student. We want to make sure that every child in our classrooms are in fact mastering the objectives. But when you think about the student level and the fact that a classroom is made up of a number of students, we want to make sure that every child in that classroom is in fact making the progress that we expect him or her to make in order to be able to end up at those state standards by the end of the year. Also think about the fact that when you're looking at data, when you're looking at learner outcomes and the assessment data, you can look at the data at the level of the student, at the level of the classroom, certainly at the level of the school that would integrate all of the classrooms within that school, but also looking at all of the schools within a district and then at the at the state level, thinking about all of the school districts that are, are part of that state program or that state department of instruction or department of education, if you will. So I want to think just a little bit first about our, um, our state standards or the standards. What exactly are those standards that we expect children in early childhood classrooms to meet? And what do we expect children to learn? You can ask the question in a number of different ways, but essentially what we want to know would be, what are the skills, um, what are, what would be um, the knowledge, what would be the behaviors that we expect children to master between age three and grade three? Well, when you think about state standards, states often adopt the standards that were developed by professional organizations. Or I think when you think about early childhood programs, certainly the professional organization on which we want to focus would be the National Association for the Education of Young Children. So when you think about the standards for early childhood programs, some of the skills, knowledge, and behaviors that we expect children to master between age three and grade three, think about these broad curriculum areas that are identified by NACI. So for example, um, certainly we expect young children to be 
between the age of three years and eight years, we expect these young children to be strengthening their large and small muscles. So certainly um, gross motor development is important. Fine motor development is important. We also expect that they are developing their sensory experiences as they are collecting information through their senses. We also expect that they're practicing healthy behaviors, and we expect that they're able to use their fine and gross motor skills um, to practice some of those healthy behaviors when you think about daily living skills or self-help skills, um, certainly thinking about how maybe fine motor skills are involved or gross motor skills when children are running and jumping or trying to brush their, their teeth or maybe trying to dress themselves, um, those kinds of daily living self-care kinds of skills. NACI also has identified the importance of certainly a strong and positive um, self-concept, appropriate self-control, the ability to sit quietly, listen attentively, follow directions are all important, the ability to interact appropriately with adults and peers. Certainly when you think about approaches to learning, thinking about positive attitudes toward learning, um, learning styles, the ability to begin a task and persevere um, to its conclusion even when you experience obstacles. You also think about certainly um, cognitive skills, the growth of the mind, how children think, the language that they use to express express their thoughts, to express their knowledge of concepts, to let us know that they're able to solve problems. So cognitive skills are an important component that is highly interrelated with the content information that we teach in early childhood classrooms. And then I want to say um, a few words about this last broad curriculum area, which is communication and language development. Certainly the ability to understand Understand language, listening comprehension is important. The ability to um, produce language, expressive language is important as well. And certainly oral language, listening comprehension, and oral expression are the foundation for, for literacy. So when you think about written language, reading and writing, certainly reading and writing build on language by ear, reading builds on language by ear, language by eye, which is the reading piece, builds on language by ear, which is the listening comprehension. And similarly, writing, which is the written expressive piece or language by hand, as Dr. Virginia Berninger refers to it, um, language by hand, the production of language using fine motor skills or visual motor integration skills, certainly builds on language by mouth, both are the expressive components of language. So language is highly important because it allows children to express their um, knowledge of concepts, the relationship between language or language and cognitive ability, but it's also important because it's foundational to the written language piece, the reading and the writing. So when you think about those broad domains and you think about your state standards, Think about how the state standards actually capture these broad curriculum areas. And if you look at Head Start, for example, you'll notice that some of those broad NACI domains are captured here as well. Certainly physical development and health, social and emotional development, as well as approaches to learning, logic and reasoning, which is that cognitive development, the language component, as well as the associated literacy piece. And then you think about knowledge, right? Think about um, all of the different types of areas in which children can exp express their knowledge. Knowledge of literacy, knowledge of math, knowledge of science, knowledge of social studies, and then also creative arts is an important um, curriculum area. Now the last one here, which is number 11, actually is one that you would focus on if you're working with children who are English language learners. So you want to make sure that English language learners 
are in fact developing knowledge of the English language consistent with their exposure to the English language. So this one doesn't apply to every child in your classroom, but would apply depending on the unique characteristics of the child. So when you think about these broad domains and you think about the state standards, think about how the state standards actually capture these broad curriculum areas. But if you think a little bit more specifically, just pulling together all of these broad domains, and you think, for example, again about Head Start and about um, the reporting requirements for states. Um, states according to, um, to Head Start programs, for Head Start programs, states are required to report information to the Office of Special Education Programs. And the type of information that they're expected to report is captured in the Child Outcomes Summary Report. And essentially what we're asked to do is provide information about the percentage of infants and toddlers with individualized family service plans, so infants and toddlers with, um, with I guess, um, early intervention needs who might be, be diagnosed with a developmental delay, we're required to provide information on specific skills. We want to make sure that infants and toddlers are demonstrating um, improvements in their social emotional skills, also improvements in the acquisition and use of knowledge and skills, and we also look at the adaptive behavior component when you're thinking about those self-help skills. So when you look at these reporting requirements, again, you're thinking about how these reporting requirements actually capture the knowledge and skills components from Head Start as well as from NACI, as well as the social and emotional components that are captured by both NACI and Head Start. So where do you get the information or where do states get the information that allow them to establish specific standards? They typically get that information from professional organizations, from um, different governmental agencies, and they use that information in, in conjunction with their knowledge of developmental expectations in order to establish um, standards for children of a certain age, children in a certain grade.